unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grant Tamasha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav. We have come to the very last episode of season 10 of our podcast. Back in 2019, we started Grant Tamasha on a whim. India's 2019 general elections were around the corner, and we sensed that there might be a temporary market for a podcast focused on Indian politics and policy, especially for those diehards hoping to keep up with the campaign action. Nearly five years later, the podcast has become a weekly fixture, and the reception has turned out to be more welcoming than we had imagined. One of the joys of doing a podcast week in and week out is the ability to read some of the best new books on India and speak with their authors, from journalists to historians and political scientists to novelists. Last year, we published our first annual list of our favorite books featured on Grant Tamasha. And as the current year comes to an end and we prepare for a brief podcast hibernation for the holidays, we thought we'd once again use our last episode of the season to share our Grant Tamasha top books of 2023. This year, we selected four books that stood out among the many excellent books we feature on the show, plus several others we didn't manage to talk about on the podcast. So let me start with the first book on our list, and this list is in no particular order. The first book I want to highlight is Shadows at Noon, the South Asian 20th Century by the historian Joya Chatterjee. This is a book that is really impossible to classify, which is what makes it so brilliant. It's a work of history, of course. But it's also equal parts memoir, social commentary, and cultural critique. Uh, It has no easy classification. Uh, Joya Chatterjee is a fellow at Trinity College in Cambridge. She's also a reader in international history at the London School of Economics. She's been the longtime editor of an academic journal called Modern Asian Studies. And in Shadows at Noon, she really sums up, I think, a career's worth of scholarship and insights into a book that uh, William Dalrymple noted in The Guardian is probably destined to become the perfect companion volume to Ram Guha's acclaimed history of post-independence India, India after Gandhi. Uh, This is not a short book. It clocks in at a breezy 864 pages. Uh, But what Chatterjee does is tells the subcontinent story from the British Raj all the way through independence and partition to the forging of the modern nation states of India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, And as you'd expect with the book of history, there's lots of politics, there's an in-depth discussion of citizenship, nationalism, and of course, all kinds of political leaders past and present. Um, There's equal attention paid to unconventional topics like food, leisure, cinema, household dynamics. And, And one of Chatterjee's most interesting literary decisions is to break the fourth wall between the author and the reader. She often reverts back to first-person narratives while recounting the region's post-1947 history through her own past, including a very compelling account of youthful summers she spent at her family compound in West Bengal. Uh, When I had a chance to speak with Joya, I asked her about this stylistic decision to break the so-called fourth wall. Here's how she explained her thinking. This uh, this was a, a strategy I decided to take up, partly because I felt that it would be hard for the reader to understand, you know, because South Asia appears to most people, even people who are insiders to South Asia, to be incomprehensible. And so what I wanted to do was place myself alongside them as this bug-eyed child, teenager, woman, becoming adult, growing old, still struggling with an incomprehension. And then it was no, I mean, it, it is a very difficult place to understand, so I wanted to put them at ease with that sense of inco- incomprehension. I also wanted to help them engage with the questions that that little girl had uh, about the society around her. Um, And that those questions, to some extent, have remained my questions all my life, but I've never been able to ask them in quite this way, because other things came up the way they do. Um, 
Some of the questions came up when he was teaching, and I began to notice these parallels because we are taught to teach in such siloed ways, you know, you teach national histories and so on, that I had some of my myself teaching the history of Pakistan and the history of Bangladesh. And hang on. Oh, there's, you know, there's, there's so much similar here. And then I began to do a bit of research on, on this. And so um, I, I began to try and think of ways to bring this to the attention of people in a way that would be less threatening and less frightening than if I do it through the prism of a, a little girl or a, you know, kind of the silly young person or a, yeah, so that's one, it's one is I do it for the reader. Book number two on our best books of the year is Migrants and Machine Politics, How India's Urban Poor Seek Representation and Responsiveness. And this is by two political scientists, Adam Auerbach and Tharik Thatchel. Uh, Adam and Tharik are two of the best young political scientists working on India and the United States. Their first books uh, collected plaudits, scooped up numerous academic prizes. Anyone who has bothered to turn on a film or crack open a book set in modern India knows that Indian slums are regularly portrayed at these really dark dens of inequity, deprivation, in which citizens are trapped in this kind of never-ending cycle of poverty, bad governance, and corruption. Migrants and Machine Politics, which is based on 10 years of fieldwork in the slums of Bhopal and Jaipur, tells us that much of what we think we know is actually based on myth and not fact. It's a, as elegant a work of empirical political science that you will ever find. Uh, through detailed ethnography as well as painstaking data analysis, Auerbach and Thatchel show readers that India slums, which are home to tens of millions of residents, are actually intricate democratic political systems in which patrons, clients, and brokers engage in an everyday contest over representation and responsiveness. And to me, one of the book's most surprising findings is the muted role of identity politics, right? This is a factor that has come to define the study of modern India. When we think about Indian politics, we think about caste, we think about religion. But because urban settlements are such diverse places, local leaders can't rely on caste or religion alone in order to win the support of voters. So contrary to many of our expectations, it's not ethnicity that brings citizens together with their leaders, but rather leaders' reputations for getting stuff done. Uh, this book will make you question many of your priors about how urban politics works, not just in India, but across the global south. When I interviewed Adam and Tharik for the book, I asked them to contrast the kind of stereotypical image of an Indian slum with what they saw firsthand on the ground. Here's how Tharik broke it down for me in May of this year. Far from being kind of chaotic or lawless spaces, um, you know, politics and slums we found to be highly active, highly organized, and highly competitive. So if you think of like ordinary residents, most of whom in, in our settlements are first generation migrants, both men and women, you know, not only do they vote at incredibly high rates, but between the vote, they're regularly organizing to uh, make claims, uh, to try and secure goods uh, or services for their settlement or to fight eviction efforts. And these efforts are often spearheaded by local leaders who emerge from within their communities. These leaders in turn are often connected to mainstream political parties. So in Jaipur and Bhopal, the cities we study, that's the, the Congress and the BJP. Uh, and importantly, these residents uh, you know, are actively wielding the competition, um, the forces of political competition. So far from kind of under the thumb of one leader or one don, uh, the kind of forces of political competition, the many local leaders who are competing for their affection, uh, and you know the many political parties who are kind of competing for their votes, residents kind of wield those forces of competition to actually shape the political networks that govern them in the city and to demand accountability and representation within city politics in ways that defy stereotypes. So uh, for us, that was, you know, this this kind of looking at how organized and competitive politics was um, in uh, in the slums of Jaipur and Bhopal, and how residents, ordinary residents, kind of use those forces of competition to sow the seeds of 
some amount of accountability um, really inverted the kind of common portrayal of these spaces, uh, uh, both in the kind of popular press and in political science scholarship. Hey, Grant the Masha listeners. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Putting this show together each week is a labor of love, but it takes a lot of work to put out a great show every week. If you'd like to support the work we do at Grant the Masha, please visit ceip.org slash donate. Don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on your favorite podcasting platform, so you'll be the first to know when a new episode rolls out. Now, the third book I want to highlight is something completely different different. First of all, it's a work of fiction. It's called Age of Vice by the journalist turned author Deepti Kapoor. Uh, Age of Vice is another sprawling book. It's a love story, which is kind of hidden inside a tale of capitalism run amok, which is hidden inside a violent story of gangland politics. Um, This isn't just a book. It's a cultural sensation. Uh, Critics have celebrated the book. There's already a television series in the works for the U.S. cable network FX. Uh, Kapoor is already working on a trilogy that's going to follow the characters from Age of Vice from the early 2000s to the start of the Narendra Modi era in 2014. Um, Age of Vice takes readers uh, across this vast Indian landscape from the kind of badlands of eastern Uttar Pradesh to the fabulous farmhouses and bungalows of New Delhi. Uh, Many of its storylines appear ripped from the headlines but melded together and kind of woven together in this really gripping narrative by Kapoor, whose previous life as a beat reporter for an Indian daily newspaper really shines through on every page. Um, It's a book that's very hard to summarize. There are lots of plot points, lots of characters, but at the heart of the novel sits the Wadia dynasty, which is a kind of shadowy business conglomerate run by Bunty Wadia, who's an industrialist who works in cahoots with the sitting chief minister of Uttar Pradesh. But the book really centers on the exploits of Bunty's son, whose name is Sonny. He's this kind of 'er ne'er-do-well scion, struggling to find his place in his family's vast business empire. Uh, I don't want to share any more plot details because there are so many twists and turns, it's likely that um, I I will ruin it for our listeners. Um, But suffice it to say that the twists and turns of this book will will leave uh, readers head spinning and and actually asking for more, even after 600 pages. I would just give kind of listeners one word of advice, judging from my own experience, which is if you are going to buy this book and read it over the holidays, uh, be prepared to basically do nothing else. Because once you jump in, uh, it's not very easy to jump out. Uh, Back in March of 2023, I asked Deepthi about the origins of Age of Ice, how she came to write this bestseller. Here's what she had to say. I mean, I want to ask you a little bit about the kind of origin story, because I understand that it took about three years to write, but you've said in other interviews that this book was informed really by several decades of living and working in India. I mentioned earlier that you'd been a journalist for a number of years. Was there a particular kind of eureka moment when the light bulb went off in your head and you said, okay, you know, this is the book that I'm going to write and this is the shape it's going to take? Um, no, there wasn't. There wasn't one moment. I think there was um, a creation of, you know, ideas. And, and um, I had my first novel came out in 2014. And that was, a, you know, a kind of um, a small novella. And it, it had some good reviews, but, you know, it didn't really make a splash. Um, but I, I, I got a foothold in the publishing industry. So there was my agent and, there, you know, and, and my editor at the time, what are you doing next? A couple of ideas didn't work. I had always had um, an idea to do another Delhi novel because my first novel is also a Delhi novel. Um, but I was kind of trying to figure out what it would be. I spent a lot of time in my 20s working as a journalist in Delhi, but also hanging out with incredibly wealthy people. So um, I wanted to write a Delhi Gatsby or even, you know, maybe a Delhi Less Than Zero kind of Bray Easton Ellis kind of book, which examined the lives of the rich and the privileged um, and, and you know, the, the damage they do to to everyone around them. And then they get to retreat behind their power and wealth. But very soon I realized that a novel about the rich in India is really a novel about everyone in India. It's a novel about 
inequality. And um, and I think it was in 2012, while I was actually finishing my first novel about character, when the Delhi um, gang rape, um, the girl, Jyoti Singh's gang rape and murder on the bus happened. And, uh, you know, besides, of course, a deep sense of shame, I felt um, it, it led me to start questioning structures um, and led me to start questioning how the system works, corruption uh, in politics, power. Um, and, and then... I think it was that moment when I started to realize that I had to bring in much more, like make it a novel of the world, of, and but not at the same time make it didactic. Um, I, I didn't want to write like a message-driven novel. That's that's not how I work. That's not the kind of novelist I am. So, and I also needed to make money as a prof. I mean, as a, as a professional novelist who has no other job, I I I needed to find a way to kind of like thread all these needles and and I and I thought, okay, I'm going to uh, try and write an entertaining novel um, that is also political, and um, and yeah, that was that was how it came about. Last but not least, the final book on our best of 2023 list is Making Bureaucracy Work, Norms, Education, and Public Service Delivery in Rural India. It's by the political scientist Akshay Mangla. Um, this book tackles, I think, one of the biggest questions there is out there. Uh, over the decades, India has developed a reputation for having a really strong society, but a pretty weak state. And we have this image in our minds of a bureaucratic and of lumbering behemoth, which has struggled to deliver the most basic things we've come to expect of states, uh, you know, public goods like healthcare, education, water, sanitation. Um, but what Akshay's book teaches us is that actually some Indian states have managed to overcome these endemic weaknesses. Um, in Making Bureaucracy Work, Akshay finds that in some unexpected places, the Indian state has actually succeeded in delivering quality primary education for its poorest citizens despite the fact that it, those places share the exact same institutional framework and often the nearly same demographic characteristics of poorly performing regions. Uh, what accounts for this difference, according to Akshay, is bureaucratic norms. Where bureaucracies are guided by deliberative norms, the state is flexible, it's adaptive, it's responsive to citizens' needs. And where civil servants are rigidly attempting to kind of follow very legalistic norms, they may deliver schools on paper, but educational outcomes still lag behind. Um, and as you kind of make your way through the series of case studies that uh, Akshay's book lays out, um, you can almost sort of feel the, the blood and the sweat and the tears of a researcher who has spent years upon years in the field kind of unearthing, again, the answer to what I think is one of the biggest puzzles there is in contemporary India and coming out the other end with a lucid explanation that is both sort of sophisticated and intricate, but also really intuitive. You know, when you read his explanation, you're sort of nodding ahead saying, you know, this makes sense. Um, I, I predict that as we we think about the future of, of work on this, um, Akshay's book is going to be wheeled out time and time again by professors as a way of demonstrating how you can do intensive field work on the one hand, um, but come up with a really parsimonious, easy to follow explanation of, of how bureaucracies and states work. When Akshay joined us on the podcast, I asked him about the importance of norms in public sector agencies, you know, inside of governments. In this clip, he explains why understanding norms is central to any study of how bureaucracies function. Norms are all around us. Um, and in some sense, the thing I find most uh, interesting about norms is that the most powerful norms around us, we don't even see. Uh, we just follow them. So I give the example in the book of uh, the norm to take one's hat off in a church. Uh, you often don't see a signboard written, uh, here's uh, the rule, take your hat off, and here's the penalty of whatever amount or something like that. We learn not to do that. And if you think about it, that's actually true for so many of the norms that we tend to follow. And so broadly thinking, about norms from a, say, social theory perspective. These are really informal rules, unwritten rules that instruct us on how to behave, how to engage with each other. And they're quite situational, so they can vary across social settings. And in my book, I look at a particular social setting, which is bureaucracy, so public sector agencies. 
And why would norms be so important for public sector agencies? Well, one, they have a public mission. They have to fulfill the interests uh, of citizens expressed through governmental laws and so on. Uh, but often those laws are vague, uh, they're abstract, they're, they cannot tell us every situation that would occur to apply the law. No law could possibly tell you every instance uh, in which it's applied. And that's where norms come in. Uh, norms help officials understand uh, and, and helps them do the work of making sense of those laws, making sense of the rules. How do I take this law and apply it in a particular instance? And I'll just give you an example of that from, say, a different field, policing, which is a, another area of my research. Police officer uh, every day is confronting situations. And in each situation, the police officer can't just go back and look at a rule book. That rule book might be there in the police officer's mind. But for example, whether I should respond as an officer to a particular complaint, whether I should go and investigate that case, and whether then I should go and actually file charges, uh, much of that is going to be based on what the police officer thinks is the prevailing conventional expectations, the norms in the police institution of which he's a part. And so in that sense, you could think of norms as help filling uh, some of the gap between law and its execution and its interpretation. I mean, before you can even enforce, you need to interpret uh, what the law says. So with that, we come to the end of our Grand Thamasha Top Books of 2023, Shadows at Noon, Migrants and Machine Politics, The Age of Vice, and Making Bureaucracy Work. These were our four favorite books of 2023. You can listen to interviews with all of these authors uh, on the Grand Thamasha podcast, wherever podcasts are available. This is the last and final episode of season 10 of our podcast. I want to thank our excellent audio engineer, Tim Martin, and our producer, Mira Verghese, for all of their help putting together the season. But most of all, I want to thank you listeners for doing what you do, um, giving us feedback, giving us encouragement, coming back week after week. Uh, we will take a little bit of a break for the holidays and be back in mid-January, and we hope to see you soon. Grant Thamasha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. This podcast is an HD Smartcast original and is available on hdsmartcast.com. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we mentioned on this week's episode, visit our website, granthamasha.com. Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Mira Verghese is our executive producer. Thanks for listening, and see you next week. To stay updated on this podcast, follow us at HD Smartcast on all the major social media platforms. To listen to more such podcasts, log on to www.hdsmartcast.com. 